So there we go. Hi, it's Ed Winruch, and this is Dialogues on how to build a culture of empathy. And today I'm pleased to be here with uh, John Winger. Thanks, uh, John, for joining me. That's a pleasure. Yeah, so the way I got uh, connected with you is I saw an article you'd written. Uh, mm -hmm. It was uh, called Beyond Empathy. And mm. um, it's about uh, you're writing about empathy and business and leadership and about role taking. So I'm very interested in uh, you know empathy in general and how we mm. foster it, but also about empathy in business. So mm. I kind of contacted you and would just like to have a little dialogue about mm. uh, your article. Mm. So um, would you like to do more of an introduction about you and your uh, company, uh, Quantum Shift, to begin okay. with? Well, we, um, I mean, one of the one of the foundations of our work is is systems thinking. Really, that's sort of the core systems thinking, and uh, and part of that is is developing better relationships between people at work. Um, uh, one of the um, the principles that underlies our our, um, our our method, if you like, well, it's not really a method. It's it's an application of a uh, of an approach that comes out of the psychodrama tradition. Mm. And, um, and, and one of the fundamental things is sociometry, which, which basically says the quality of an outcome is directly related to the quality of a relationship between the people who are trying to generate the outcome. So it seems reasonable that what you'd want to do is have um, good and robust working relationships. If businesses are about generating some, some kind of outcome in the world, then you need to have uh, well-connected people with, with relationships in which they can... Um, have all sorts of conversations that they need to have, and part part of that um, is is realised through um, a, a, a process we use called role reversal. And I, I've read a lot, a fair amount about the importance of bringing empathy and compassion into the workplace. And it's it's um it's wonderful that we live in an age where you can write these things and read these things, and people don't think you're a fruit loop. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which maybe ten years ago, you, you know, people might have thought you were a bit too touchy feely. I think there's enough science around and research around that, that shows that that kind of human side, the interpersonal side, and the intrapersonal side um, of ourselves is uh, probably more becoming more important in, a, in an age where things are increasing, increasingly complex and interconnected. So um, empathy is not kind of one of our core uh, objectives, but it's certainly um, uh, part of the whole system in, in the work that we do. And my background, um, I've been a teacher and my interest was really in humanistic teaching. And then I kind of cross-trained and became a counsellor. And of course in counselling mm. there's a fair amount of learning about empathy. And, um, when I was doing my psychodrama training back in the late 90s and developed um, a, a bit of an understanding around role reverse and what actually happens to me when I role reverse, it feels like a really deep kind of empathy. And when I was thinking about my, my counselling training, it, it felt that um, the, the content was, was about attempting to understand what it's like for someone else, which is absolutely valid, but it felt a little bit like a, a thought experiment in some cases. And there were some clients that I may have really struggled to understand what it was like to be in their shoes. When I encountered role reversal, my world changed because it was a, a whole person exercise. And while empathy, I think, takes us pretty far down the track of, of reducing isolation and bringing people together. There's a, there's a bit that sometimes we get stuck on, you know, we've, we find it difficult to, to empathize with people who have values and beliefs that are quite different from ours. Uh, it's easier with people who, who, with whom we find some commonality. When we role reverse, we actually have a full body visceral experience of how similar we actually are to other people, even the ones that push our buttons or challenge us. Um, so I just thought I would add a little something into the conversation and, and bring role reversal. And I know that the work that <clears throat> that we, we've been trained in, that experiential action methods, is um, is uh, in some quarters still seem as a little bit um, well, not not entirely mainstream. But I think that what we have um, in in this in this methodology is, uh, and I don't talk, I'm not talking about quantum shift. I'm talking about the whole the whole body of, of psychodramatists and sociodramatists. I think there's something really important to add to the um, the body of professional and personal development. Mm. Yeah. So you had written that article, and um, let me just see, just read how it starts off. It says, "Is a so." 
psychiatrist. I'm passionate about people in business developing greater ability to stand in each other's shoes. Oh. Uh, it's one of the cornerstones of the work we do at Quantum Shift and is uh, central to nurturing greater health in organizations. This oh. is often given the name of empathy. I might mention Quantum Shift at your site is quantumshift.co.nz. So you're in New Zealand. Uh -huh. And um, so uh, that's kind of just setting the kind of the, the, the context of it. And you're, you're uh -huh. talking. So the part that you're really interested in is, is empathy as kind of role reversal, a kind of perspective taking, taking on, uh, you know, imagining. Uh, yourself as the other and I can oh. see from your article you'd really had delved into it because you're kind of uh, referencing you know other works and so forth oh. and kind of the way I see uh, the definition of empathy which I think is, is really relevant uh, here oh. is I see empathy as four parts and the first part would be like a self empathy so that's sensory awareness mindfulness of what's going on inside myself oh. uh, the second part would be a mirrored empathy so that's, uh, uh, as I see you or you see me, we have mirror neurons that are kind of firing and we're, we're seeing each other's actions. We can sense each other's intentions to these mirror neurons. Mm. The uh, third part was what I would call imaginative empathy, which is I think really what you're getting into. And, you know, the academics call it cognitive empathy or perspective taking, but it's really where you kind of imagine yourself in someone else's situation and you viscerally start feeling what it is that they're feeling. Like you can really take it on. And, uh -huh. and uh, I've seen that in uh, mediation training where uh -huh. we, we uh, do practice mediations with, uh, with uh, you know, roles, taking on different roles, being the disputant, being the mediator. And uh -huh. everybody can just step right in the role of uh -huh. people who are disputants. You give them a few guidelines, you know, you're this person, this is the situation. And for me, it's always amazing how easy it is for people to step into that role. And oh. then the uh, fourth part, which I th saw you'd kind of mentioned, addressed there too, is uh, you'd mentioned we create in ourselves, we generate in ourselves a creative empathy. And oh. for me, that's the last part, is the empathic action, or I'm starting to like the term um, empathic creativity. Because oh. as we really connect with other people, it's like, we automatically start creating, having this sense of creativity that oh. uh, happens. So I very much see that role playing as a really fundamental, you know, part of that spectrum. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that as I, as I hear, as I listen, I I think that that kind of makes sense. And obviously, what what we would do and, and others would do was was uh, kind of slotted into our experience and so my experience of being trained in the psychotrauma method I'm slotting what you're describing in those different types of empathy as, as a sort of a um, my understanding of, of, of role reversal really and it enc encompasses all of those things the, the, I suppose one the one thing that would be um, uh, there's probably some some add-ins there when you talk about uh, mediation training when, when we're using role reversal, we're working with people's real life experiences. So we're not giving them roles. There's no role playing. Mm -hmm. They're actually taking up the role of, of another person in a real life reenactment of a situation that they have had in their lives. That's probably the only subtle difference that I would find. And I think that's the thing that eases people into doing it. Um, I think there's also a capability that people need to have in order to do it. I mean, often... Um, people have an underdeveloped ability to role reverse well and deeply with another if it's not been done to them very much in their in their lives um, so uh, I mean I think it's quite a brave thing really to reverse roles with someone to, to, to set up a situation that might have been conflictual and you've got a, a reenactment the other person is sitting opposite you mm -hmm. mm. We, choose that. we choose an auxiliary to take up that role and in that moment, you're faced with that person. Your emotions are heightened as, if, as they were in the original situation. And, uh, and, and it's a brave thing in a moment like that when you've got somebody who is taking an opposite position to you for just a moment to give up your beliefs, your values, and go and sit in the other person's chair and physically take up their position. It's quite a brave thing. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. So for your your feeling, especially for people who haven't done role reversal, that you know to sit in a situation and then say, okay, do role reversal. They they need uh, there's a certain bravery kind of involved there to, to be willing to take that leap. You know, maybe that leap absolutely. of faith. That this is going to work, and it's not going to blow up in my face, or absolutely, I'm going to be ridiculed or something, or it's going to be absolutely. painful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're doing it in the in the business setting, like you're in a sense like uh, like a coach to a business coach. And you're saying here you can try this and and try. Or how, what's what's the context that you're Most using? Of it. Yeah, yeah we, I mean we're working in 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 organizations, um, local government, not for profit, commercial, um, corporate. Um, it's um, we work in the context of helping people to um, find new ways, develop some spontaneity in themselves to respond differently um, to people they work with, to their environment. Um, it's a thing when, 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 and most of our work is in the context of groups as well. So. It's it's kind of coaching, but it's not coaching. It's it's a it's a uh, it's a it's a process where we work with a whole group of, of people. Most often, we occasionally do some one to one stuff, and we 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 apply a process of warm up until they get to the point where they they are thinking about or recalling moments in their work where they have got a little bit stuck with other people. Mm -hmm. So again, it's it's a it's a it's a um, it's a component of the work. The empathy, developing developing greater empathy. The 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 core of the work is how do I develop uh, and deepen my relationships with people I work with. So we, because it's a systems thinking approach as well. We don't say it's not about solving problems. It's you know where where are the bits? There's a whole bunch of stuff that you do in work which is really really useful and good. And then there are other bits naturally where you get a little bit stuck. So how can we develop some spontaneity to get beyond those stuck moments? And most often, the stucknesses occur in relationships with people, and so it's about developing those relationships. You know, in a in a, in a in a complex world, it's not up to each of us individually to solve things or deal with dilemmas. We have to do this collectively. And if we if we continue to operate in the world as um, isolates, we're not going to get very far as a species. Mm -hmm. So the whole the whole thrust of of the psychodrama method. And then what we have distilled from that to apply in the workplace is about reducing isolation, increasing connection, increasing understanding between people. And in a business well, sense, it seems like yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You know, in the business sense, that's that's compelling because when when people see the power of cooperation, then they go, well, actually, this is useful for us as well. It's not just for those touchy feely counselor types. Yeah. So you're really. It seems to me that that's the essence of empathy because empathy is about relationships and sure. people really putting themselves in the shoes of others. So the sure. role playing is like literally kind of doing that and having exercises and processes that kind of help it. And yeah. it sounds like you're also looking for kind of areas that are stuck and then yeah. bringing those uh, tools uh, to those areas where people are stuck and using yeah. role playing and, and so yeah. forth to kind of yeah. open those up and get the uh, energy kind of flowing and the understanding, the empathic understanding kind of going. It, absolutely, it is about um, f freeing people up so that they're, they're, they're um, much more in a flow with themselves and with other people. And if, if we were to say that this is, this is what you'll get, there, there are a number of people in, in the organizational world will go, that sounds lovely, but what's the point of it? And so the whole thing about using particular work experiences and making it very focused around what goes on in your work, it, it makes it a purposeful exercise for people. And for me, I, I utterly buy into the fact that we need to have empathy for empathy's sake. Yeah. But in terms of going into organizations, um, I think there's um, there's also a clear link, and and I really like the fact that there's a lot written and in, in research these days about the clear link between these really essential human qualities and effectiveness at work. Uh, you were also talking about leadership, um, empathy in leadership. There's a lot being kind of written about that now too, mm -hmm. about the importance of if someone's a leader, they really need to 
I mean, they can do a top down, like just go do what I tell you to, but maybe more effective leadership is really being able to empathize with all the people that you're leading and kind of lead yeah. through empathy versus kind of a top down. Yeah. Well, for, for, yeah, I mean, that top down thing is, I think, um, is not going to get us very far. Really, I, I'm not in favor of hierarchical structures at all. And there are some new ways. I mean, systems thinking is teaching us a lot about that. There are actually new ways of organizing our societies, our schools, our institutions, our workplaces that are not about leaders being in control. And it's a, it seems a simple um, shift in in perspective, but it's actually quite quite a, a, a sea change in in how we view people and how we view our workplaces. You know, I, I often use. Um, the the, um, the the shift in in perspective that occurred when Copernicus suggested that actually it's the sun that's the center of the solar system, and it took 150 years until that became mainstream. And it took in that 150 years people like Newton doing you know applying some science to prove that Copernicus was right. Um, I think in the same way that if we look at leadership. Has it, has it comes from a particular mindset or paradigm that the leaders or the managers are the ones who control a business. Um, businesses are not machines, neither are people parts of a machine. And so I think there's a connection with those, those folks who want to develop a greater uh, or a different mindset of what it means to be a leader includes developing yourself, your intrapersonal skills and your interpersonal skills. The job, to my mind, of a leader is not about running a business. It's about um, corralling, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, a, a united uh, efforts towards the achievement of an objective. And part of that is, I mean, I think if you're a systems thinker, part of that is not just about this business, it's about making money. I think anybody that's trying to do that in business will not be very successful for very much longer. We, we gather together to achieve a common purpose, and if we think about the wider system, about the earth, well, how are we going to do this in a sustainable way that's not going to be harmful to others and to future generations? So I think there's a whole new shift in what leaders need to develop, part of which is the ability to have good interpersonal skills. But, I mean, I think your interpersonal skills spring out of your intrapersonal skills. So when you talked about having empathy for yourself, Again, I attached it to an understanding that I have, and I say it's a good self-companion. We certainly need to have the ability to companion ourselves, and I think a leader does as well. Um, if we have developed good self-awareness abilities, then we're more able, I think, to develop good interpersonal abilities. It seems odd to me that someone would say um, that they're able to have empathy for others when they have um, low awareness of themselves. How, how can you understand another if you don't even understand yourself? And the, the two go hand in hand. Yeah, are, are you uh, bringing, I don't, didn't notice, I mean, I saw you mentioned uh, Simon Baron Cohen for the first yeah. part of your part. You're talking about empathy is the spectrum. So it's yeah. not like empathy is on or off, but that it's, right. uh, it's, uh, it's he uses the time. metaphor of uh, light, you know, a dimmer switch, yeah. right? We can yeah. turn up the dimmer switch and it kind of yeah. goes up and, and down and, and, uh, so that's kind of like a part of it. And then there's the uh, part about the mirror neurons, which I find is kind of like a real uh, core part of the empathy. And that's what I was talking about, the mirroring, in the sense that when we do an action and we see an action, the same neurons fire in our brain. And that connection and relationship, people, is almost like clean, clearing the channel, you know, Clearing that mirror neuron channel, getting the stuff out of the way that might be blocking our, our, mm. uh, uh, you know, our connection with others, mm. and um, we're doing. I mean, we're, we're putting this into the context of of uh, systems change. At a, how do we create a movement to transform society? That's right. World culture to raise the value of empathy within society, and. Um, that part, I mean, there's, we can kind of break it down into those different components, that spectrum of experience and you know, the self-empathy, the mirrored empathy, how do we get a more reflecting, more high-fidelity empathy between each other? You know, we're empathizing all the time, but we can maybe raise that fidelity, that quality, that depth. And what we've been using is reflective listening in our empathy circles. 
mm. which is uh, which is kind of the Carl Rogers uh, yeah. work, where you just someone says something, you reflect back, and then we do a reversal so that then that person speaks to someone else, and mm. we're doing this continuous uh, reflection, and it really helps create that fidelity. And something mm. we're doing next is we're building developing a user guide. So we're mm. wanting to go into that step that you're talking about, which is the uh, kind of the imaginative empathy, the role playing. So we're actually imagining being the user guide, mm. right? So we're all taking on the role of the user guide, and then we're speaking. Like I'm saying, I, I start off saying, "I'm the user guide. I'm so lonely here. Nobody's paying attention to me. I I need attention. I want someone to pay attention." And then mm. somebody reflects back, you know until I feel fully heard yeah. and then it's that person's turn to talk a, a, as the user guide and they really kind of, it's, it's really getting into that next step um, mm. and, and you're, you're, you're mentioning a lot of different ways right there's you know be the user guide you know take yeah. the imagination be the person you know I could be you we're, we're, we could shift positions uh, another thing we've been I've been looking at is um, is uh, metaphors. So for me, empathy is like a cornucopia. It's like a, it's a, it opens a world of experience. And, yes. and I experience, it's kind of, I, I experience other people's feelings and, you know, and, and energy and it kind of opens my world to this cornucopia of experience. Oh. And then for, and then what is your metaphor? If you had a metaphor of empathy, what would that be like? Um. It's a good question. I don't. Again, as I, I was saying, we, our work isn't about empathy. Uh -huh. It's not a word that we use. It's not a word we use. We talk about um, role reversal, which for me, there they are different things. Uh -huh. One of the for me, and, and I might be entirely wrong, and I'm happy to be corrected by my psychodrama colleagues. For uh -huh. me, empathy is a spin-off of role reversal. Role reversal is an act. It's a deep act, and it's a commitment to another person. Um, I think empathy. As, as can be described by, by um, say, a Rogerian counselor, would be a spin-off of role reversal. They are utterly intertwined, but I don't, it's a, a metaphor for empathy. I don't know. I really don't know. It's not, I'll give that some thought and send you an email. I don't know. Uh, I, we could have done some role-playing here to try it out. I have another metaphor that empathy is like, um, is like disco balls. We're all like disco balls and we're reflecting our whole environment around us. Mm. And that's kind of the mirror neuron component. And maybe mm. when we become afraid, you know, there's one person we're afraid of, and then those mirrors shift so mm. that we don't mirror them anymore. Mm. So, um, and then we're all kind of dancing, mirroring each other to varying degrees, and how do we kind of sharpen that uh, mirroring? So mm. the reason I was saying that is I could just imagine, and I've done this before, where people come up with their metaphors, and then you do kind of a psychodrama between the metaphors. So mm. the metaphors start talking to each other. You know, mm. I, as a disco ball, talk to you as uh, whatever, you know. So, yeah. so there's many forms of, of, sure. this, of this psychodrama. And, sure. Um, I guess we were also talking about the definitions. I guess I'm starting it with the mirror neurons. The mirror neurons, yeah. that reflection is kind of a, a component of this, how it mm. is that we experience other people. So mm. I guess in, our, in, our, in, in, in sort of the, 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 um, the phases of, of human growth, um, f from, from a psychodramatic perspective, there's a there's a bit that comes right early on when when you're a baby and it's called doubling and it's it's you know it's that thing when you see a when you see a mum and a baby and the baby's just goo gooing and going and the mum you see the mum speaking to the baby oh you're hungry oh yes you are oh yes you are there's that attunement that a mum has with a baby that's um if and if it's tuned in well that attunement. What she's doing is doubling. In, in other words, yeah, of, and, and other other um, traditions would say that there's that they are one. They are still one. You know. So the, the, as far as the baby is concerned, not in a conscious way, of course. Mum is just an extension of itself. 
Mm -hmm. So doubling is about being another you. And that's a phase in development where you get good doubling if you're, if you're fortunate. And um, I, I, you know, if you look at you can look at attachment theory, and there's some parallels with that sort of stuff. Good attachment, good doubling. If someone is well doubled in those first few years of life, then they're able in the next phase of their development to take on a mirror. In other words, that's that kind of Rogerian stuff when you say something and I mirror it back, and you go, "Yes, that's right." And the mirroring is the bit where the separation has occurred. You're becoming more of an individual. And, and you acknowledge that somebody else really gets me. That's great. I'm being mirrored. I'm being validated. If the doubling hasn't occurred well, and if the mirroring hasn't occurred well, role reversal is a real challenge for people. And this is what I was saying, that some folks really find it difficult. It's a brave thing to do as well. If you've been well doubled and well mirrored in your life, you know that you are okay. You, 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 know, you exist and you're okay. If you know that, and at quite a deep level, it's easy when you go to, not easy, <laughs> it's easier, or you'll be more willing to role reverse with someone because you know that you're okay. You can go and be someone. It's not imagine or pretend, it's you be someone in, in, using, in using the method. Then you get to come back and be yourself, and you can walk away from yourself for just a moment and reverse roles because you have a reasonably firm sense of who you are. So the, the role reversal, uh, like the doubling and the mirroring, are things which give you a sense of I'm, I'm here and I'm okay. Role reversal is when you get to that stage in your development where you're developing empathy for others. But it's like those first two things need to have happened well enough for you to be able to have a, a, a caring and an ability to see what it is from somebody else's point of view. And, of course, then the role reversal there is a creativity involved. And so, yes, you can get a sense of what it's like to be in someone else's world. And while it may not be exact, because you can never really inhabit my skin and have my experiences in life, if your ability of role reversal is good, you, you'll bring a deep understanding as much as you can, plus you'll bring your own creativity, because that's the moment when you go, actually, we have more in common than we imagined. There's so much in this cosmos that you and I share. And my eyes have just opened to that. Isn't that marvelous? And I think that's when you, when you get the role reversal, you get people's, people to be able to uh, relate easier. There's, there's not a, you're different from me. Well, there is, but there's, there's, a, there's a greater appreciation of the difference. But there's also a, we have more in common than we thought. And I, and I, and I think in, in, in sociometry, which we apply, that, that's one of the, the assumptions we actually have as humans more in common than separates us. You know, um, mm -hmm. I think there are many conflicts in the world that, that might have been uh, ameliorated or been quite different if people had a greater ability to roll reverse. Uh, so it, you're, it, there's a whole child development component to it that yeah. you're seeing. And it starts with the, the baby who's, you know, warbling and gooey. And then the parents kind of reflect that back. Everybody, you see that all the time. Everybody comes, oh, blah, 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 and they kind of reflect it. And then it, there's something about it that you see yourself kind of connected with them. And, and just like That's with right. uh, dogs, they see light. Right. They, don't, they don't see themselves separate. They're, she's, they're right. feeling themselves as developing. Uh, I like the word resilience, kind of like this yeah. empathic resilience, this grounding, this, you know, this uh, wholeness or this integrity. And mm -hmm. that, um, so you go through these different stages, and then there's that, um, you're calling that uh, a doubling, that mm -hmm. kind of quality you're just kind of seeing. Then there's mirroring, and mm -hmm. then there's the um, kind of role reversal, where you're kind of like really stepping out of your position. That's right. And yeah. then, so you're seeing kind of these graduated uh, steps to expanding our kind of way of being, or... That's right, and, 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 and reducing the disconnection we have from others as well. Yeah, yeah. and the, yeah, those and there's a there's a sense of I mean for the for that mirroring that we're doing, you know, in that in our empathy circles, it really you know at first people are kind of like awkward about it. They feel like That's it's right. kind of superficial verbally, right. like I'm, you know, this is not. But it's like slowly it kind of sinks deeper and deeper, and oh. uh, then it's like wow, this is pretty. You know, this is, and then there's like, 
I don't have to fight to be heard, which seems to be one of the things in business is you're like everybody's fighting to be heard and this it causes huge amount of stress. Yeah. And in this reflective listening, it's like, oh, I know I'll be heard. And then people kind of sink into that and they, they kind of relax and mm. so um, there's there's so there's a whole that's the one thing we're looking at, is that's why I want to talk to you is I'm really interested in the you know, how we can kind of expand having that full spectrum of, of techniques that we can use to mm. uh, deepen empathy and you mentioned the study too. I think it was dynamics of creativity and empathy and role reversal yeah. contributions from neuroscience, and that was from Danny something or other in at the university there in oh, Israel. Hmm. Uh, you you read that? I was wondering what you got out of that uh, study. You, um, yeah. now, you, now you're testing me. Um, Oh, he's at the University of Hoffa, Danny Young. Yeah, 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 I sent him an email and asked him to do a discussion too. So, I'm oh yeah, kind of waiting um, on this. Just gonna have another look. Well, there's so many tools in the uh, in the uh, art therapy realm. I think they're very applicable to fostering oh. empathy, and and that's uh, he's in the. Uh, Art therapy, I think, uh, department there. Mm. Well, he's just talking about uh, role reversal, kind of uh, yeah. using psychodrama role reversal and yeah. how it relates to empathy and mm. and the neurobiology. Because that's something I'm very interested in too. Is you know I've interviewed a lot of the neuroscience, uh, Marco Iacoboni and mm. Christian Kieser's over there in Holland and mm. from MIT and all that kind of stuff. So. Mm. Uh, really wanting to understand the the neurobiology of what's going on. It's really clear, just the reflection, mm. uh, the empathic reflection is just kind of allowing the mirror neurons to uh, to uh, work better, it seems to me. It's mm. kind of taking the judgments out, taking the, you know, trying to fix someone, trying to control mm. someone. So we're just kind of clearing that mirror neuron channel is how I'm kind of seeing it. Right. So the role playing is is uh, it's really about taking on someone's position and really connecting from your own experience mm. uh, to your felt. Ex you use the word felt experience. Um, felt experience. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's different if I if I um, say say you and I are doing some uh, having a conversation about. Um, uh, you know, if you were a client and I was doing some one-to-one -one stuff, and you, you're talking about a, a member of your staff who you find really challenges you, you just you, you don't know how to get through to them. You you um you you're constantly in conflict. We we could have a conversation about this stuff, and I could say, well, put yourself in their shoes, and you you could do that in your head. Mm -hmm. When when I set up a scenario, we have. Uh, a reenactment we have you know so what where where did this happen in my office okay well set your office up here so they get chairs and tables and they take a few minutes to warm up and recreate the physical stage that this thing took ha took place on and then they say well i was sitting here and they were sitting there okay there's something that's big that's that's quite different for them they have a felt experience when we start an interaction, a conversation, a replay of a conversation they had where they got a bit stuck. And then you know, reverse roles, and they go and sit in the other person's chair. It's a whole body experience because there's a, there's been enough of a warm up. We don't just throw people in the deep end. There's a warm up, so they they are there again. When you when you go reverse roles, if they've warmed up well and they go and sit in that chair, they're, they're having a whole body experience that's beyond cognitive understanding. It's beyond words for some people. Some folks, you just see it in their body. Their face softens, their, their bodies, you know, become less rigid. They, and it's, um, 
it, it's it's quite profound for people when I see them when I see them have these experiences and when they they narrate at the end what what happened for them. They go, I've really tried um, to understand what it's like from their point of view, but I've never really understood from their point of view what it was like until I went to be them. Mm. So that I mean, that, I think that's that's a significant thing. So the 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 empathy or the ability to understand what it's like from somebody else's shoes is is facilitated, I think, by the application of role reversal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's really you're wanting to really get them into uh, feeling what the other person feels, and then kind of having that feeling, it's almost as if they're totally in the other person's shoes, and kind of the conflicts. It kind of gives a the conflicts have a chance to be uh, the knots can be undone in That's a sense. Right. There's That's something right. some kind of a creativity that happens when we can take the other person's perspective. There's mm -hmm. something that's happening that uh, just at a felt sense that your your body f searches for the solution to the problem and and it kind of opens up new possibilities then That's for, right. for undoing those conflicts. That's right. And when 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 it, it's um, when all of the cells in your body have learned what it's like to be the other person, you you have a different platform on which to create a different way of relating with the person. You know, when you when you re reverse roles and you go. Now I knew in my head that this woman's twenty years older than me, and that she might struggle a bit with me being her manager. I knew that in my head. But I never really got it. There's 20 years of life on this planet that she has had that I had a glimpse of, and all of my cells got that when I went to be her. Now I get it. Now I get it. So when, as I as I relate to her as her manager, I I have got some new ideas of how I could be with her, where I wouldn't. I'm not going to push her buttons. You know, I have some new ideas of how I'll be with her so that we can be more cooperative together. Um, and you see that. Um, but people in themselves soften; they become less um, fixed on how they think they should be and how they want others to be. It's, it's quite it's quite a lovely thing, mm -hmm. you know. That that kind of seeing the, the seeing and hearing people say, "No, I knew that in my head, but now I really get it. All mm -hmm. of my cells get it now. I, I, my body's caught up with my brain." Mm -hmm. And then yeah. there's the solutions that come out of it, and you're right. seeing you're seeing those stories play out, and those realities play out in in your uh, workshops and that's right, and that's right. Groups that you that's right, and, it, and it's and it's it's delightful when people when they get that understanding and awareness of of what it's like to be the other, and they come back to be themselves. It's delightful to see the kind of creative things that they come up with in the moment that they would have. Um, been blocking themselves for them, they would they would say, I, "I never would have thought of doing that," or that that's quite um, exciting or life giving, or I can see this is going to be really interesting to give this a go and try this. Um, yeah. So, so, it's, it's so the, yeah. So the creativity is really sparked by the feeling of what the other person is experiencing. Mm. That that is kind of like the spark that. Uh, like once you get that, that then from there that spark of creativity, which we're all, I mean, I kind of like. That's the, you know, that feeling of new possibilities and new solutions to problems to move forward. Yeah, kind of happen. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, how are you moving forward? What's your how are you continuing your work? What's uh, the future for your work around empathy and role playing and uh, reversal. Well, really, really, it's um, we're just sort of carrying on as we have been, um, looking to develop new um, contacts with businesses that are interested in, in focusing a little bit more on the the, um, the interpersonal stuff. Looking for um, organisations that are looking to um, expand their thinking about how they might do things differently. Um, so, um, you know, I think systems thinking really is the thing I'm I'm passionate about that people we see the world as an interconnected place that um, there, there, are, there are folks out there more and more who are um, open to the idea that actually the world is quite a complex place let's stop trying to get rid of that complexity how do we embrace it and the, the real thing that we are um, looking to develop in the folks we work with is spontaneity you know you talked about sparks and creativity 
in, in Moreno's writings, he talked about creativity is the arch substance. It's the thing that will get us, you know, keep us evolving and keep us, keep us going. Creativity is the arch substance. The arch catalyst is spontaneity. In that moment when someone role reverses and then they go back to being themselves, they, they've had a moment of spontaneity, of openness, of I can do something that's not the same patterns of behavior that I used to always do. And you, you, you like the creativity with that spontaneity. And, and people come up with things which are, um, I guess they're more, um, they're more appropriate, they're more, um, they're more compassionate, um, they're, they're purposeful. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just carrying on and, and working to develop greater spontaneity in people um, and, and assisting them to think a little bit bigger about themselves, their workplaces, their colleagues, their businesses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, I'm working on this uh, full time on how do we build a culture of empathy and doing interviews and panels. So, you know, I hope we can kind of keep the conversation going. Sure. Maybe do some, uh, you know, panel discussions, get a couple other people in a call like this, kind of looking at some of these uh, topics about empathy hmm. and business and, um, you know, keep this uh, exploration going. Sure thing. Okay. Well, great. Well, then, uh, John, I guess we'll uh, bring the, the discussion to a close. Uh, and again, your uh, company is Quantum Shift. It's quantumshift.co.nz. And uh, people can contact you uh, there. And mm -hmm. um, I look forward to our next conversation. Great. So until then. Okay.